Good evening. I'm Elaine Meyer Lee, Senior Vice President and Provost of Goucher College. I'm delighted to welcome you to the fourth in our series of virtual speaker events as part of the Robert and Jane Meyerhoff Visiting Professorship Series. Jane Bernstein Meyerhoff, class of 45, was a distinguished Goucher alumna whose dedicated efforts to support the college, its students, and its community has created a lasting legacy. It was her vision to create the Robert and Jane Meyerhoff Visiting Professorship to bring distinguished scholars like tonight's guest to Goucher in the interest of advancing dialogue on the pressing issues of our time. This year marks the 40th year of the series at Goucher. I speak for all of us at Goucher in thanking Robert Meyerhoff, Rita Becker, and the entire Meyerhoff family for their generosity, as well as to the Goucher staff who helped to make tonight's event possible. Tonight, I am especially honored to welcome Tressie McMillan Cottom. Dr. McMillan Cottom is an associate professor in the I School at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, senior research fellow at the Center for Information Technology and Public Life at UNC, faculty associate at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center, and a 2020 MacArthur Fellow. Audiences and institutions have lauded her incisive analysis of issues of higher education, work, race, class, gender, digital societies, and her impact. Her books include Lower Ed, her critically acclaimed work on for-profit higher education and social inequality, and Thick and Other Essays, which was a nonfiction finalist for the National Book Awards. And her cultural podcast is Here to Slay, her current research examines racial capitalism in platform economies and what she calls hustlepreneurship. She describes her newest project, Essaying, as a newsletter and community for curious people, people who ruin movies for their friends, and anyone who has ever said they wish they could sign up for her class. That certainly includes me. Along those lines, she's also one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter. Moderating tonight's conversation and taking questions from you all for Dr. McMillan Cottom will be Nicole Johnson, our Associate Dean of Students at Goucher. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Nicole and Tressie McMillan Cottom. Thank you, Tressie. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for having me. And thank you uh, to uh, Elaine for the wonderful introduction and for you for taking time out to moderate this conversation. Cole's trust, pleasure. trust me, it is my pleasure. So just to give you some backstory, I go back with you since the blog, Some of Us Are Brave. What's your username or are you going to tell me? <laughs> and I know who you are. I do. I know almost all of the old. I do. I know almost all of the old heads usernames. Yeah, it really it, Yeah. Yeah, so that's me. I mean, gosh, yesterday, two days ago, I had one of those Facebook memories pop up, you know, mm -hmm. that told me I, uh, I'd been out of graduate school for X amount of years. And so that means you're talking 11, 12 years at least, Nicole. Yes, yes. yeah, a long time. We'll have to talk off screen for that. For gotcha. That. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about and throw out the first question, I actually put a link uh, to essaying in the chat for the attendees and the rest of the panelists. Could you just talk about um, how you are defining public intellectual and what, how you're using essaying to illustrate your definition and giving us that peek behind of what essaying is? Yeah, thanks for that. Because this is for, for me, this is a um, passion project mm -hmm. um, that was coming out of, you know, I was post tenure uh, a couple of years ago, and I made the move to UNC and really just had a moment to take a breath for the first time in quite a long time. Everybody here who's ever been on the tenure track of the first few years in a staff position knows what that's like. I finally kind of got my head, my feet beneath me, understood the, the basics of this job. And I thought, well, gosh, I don't know how to have a good time anymore, right? Which a, a lot of what was my uh, hobby um, had become my work. 
reading, writing, thinking, right? And I thought, well, uh, I'm going to read and write something, read and write about something that I just enjoy, that has absolutely no expectation of becoming an academic project or even necessarily a public project. Um, and that's when I started reading everything that had ever been published about Dolly Parton. It was as good a subject to start with as any. Uh, I go way back with Dolly. I thought it would be fun. Uh, and on the way to having fun, a couple of things happened. Uh, uh, the MacArthur Fellowship happened. And uh, for the first time, I had the opportunity to think about, had the opportunity and the resources. That's the great gift, frankly, of the MacArthur Fellowship. Um, to, to give you a moment to reflect on like what you want your your overall legacy to be, your overall contribution to something a little broader than just your professional security, you know, what did I want that to be? Um, and I really just kept coming back to something um, a friend and coach has told me over the last couple of years, which is, you know, you can be good at many things, you can be great at some things, and you can excel usually at one. Mm. And I started thinking, what do I excel at <laughs> above and beyond? What am I good at? And what really kind of gets my motor going um, is being in conversation with people about what I think are social problems uh, that we don't think of as social problems, these sort of counterintuitive social and cultural moments. Um, and I love being in conversation with people who want to actually wrestle with that, who want to think through what it means and want to do it in, with a bit more nuance mm -hmm. than typical publishing allows us to do. So, um, you know, I'm very, very into the, you know, where does this get complicated? Right. How can we surprise ourselves about what we think we already know and believe? And the reason why I love that and the reason why I think if I excel at anything, I excel at that um, is because I do think this is just a moment in time when I think public intellectualism and I think intellectualism writ large, intellectual work is really being called on the carpet for reconsidering its significance. And so I'm a social scientist and significance to us has been reduced to like an empirical measure, you know, whether something is statistically significant. Um, and I had a professor many years ago who used to say, listen, I can teach you statistical significance, but you're going to have to figure out practical significance for yourself, which meant how does your work matter? To whom does it matter? To whom are you responsible, right? Who are you, who's holding you to task for your work? And essaying is me issuing an invitation to people to say, all right, take me to task on these things. Let's enter into a relationship and a conversation about things um, that we think matter, uh, that you can't really talk about in very thin, short, brief, shallow ways. They do require more sustained engagement. Um, and let's have fun with it. <laughs> let's have a really good time. Because I think our emotions are, um, we don't do a good job of attending to the emotions of doing hard work, hard thinking, and hard collaboration. But it can, it can be enjoyable and it can be sustainable. And in fact, I think it has to be if we want people to keep showing up for it, right? It can't be all drudge work. And so we're trying to have a good time over there. And I think we're having a really great one. We spent the last few weeks breaking apart what it means to think about a pop culture icon as a political figure, as an economic relationship. Um, we're thinking about the craft of writing, of taking the audience seriously, which academics don't often do uh, in particular. So taking our audiences seriously, wanting to write really good arguments, but wanting to write them well, and what does it mean to do that? Uh, and we're having a really good time. And it's the basis of a program they have going forward, um, trying to build the foundation for a fellowship program that will support other thinkers and writers who want to do that work. Oh, that's amazing. So let me dig a little deeper about the public part and especially the writing part. Mm -hmm. There's been, I think, a series of Twitter threads like in the last couple of days talking about accessibility. Mm -hmm. And is it really good academic work if it's not accessible? And what is good writing? Can you talk mm -hmm. about more about being this public intellectual and making your work accessible mm -hmm. and readable? that many constituencies and communities can actually read it? I think that that is the best uh, tradition that's working in the best tradition of what I understand 
black intellectual thought to be in the US. And so you have, when you have, when you come in the tradition of, um, as I think of myself, W.B. Du Bois, who always understood a practical significance of his work and writing broadly for audiences. Um, and in one of his autobiographies, he has this piece about, you know, you can tell he's responding to the critics of his time who are wondering like why W.B. Du Bois is writing in the crisis and writing essays. And he goes, um, and even fiction, he had fiction, he had short stories, he had essays. Um, he was agnostic on genre and really did quite well across all of them, which is just phenomenal. Uh, but he has in one of his autobiographies because the great man wrote more than one, of course. And he, where he has this thing about, he said, when you are a black scholar, when you are a black intellectual, he said, you do not, have the luxury of not speaking to people. Mm -hmm. Our work always has a built-in practice, practical significance. Um, you know, I think about uh, Chandra Prescott's book, has a book out, she's a um, physicist. Um, and here's this like realm of science that you would think is really beyond everyday discourse. It's not for the typical reader, but when a black woman is doing physics, right? There's always a practical impact and significance to that work. So it, if, if it's going to be built into the work that I'm doing just by a function of who I am and that I'm doing it as a Black woman, it seems to me I'd better get good at doing it, right? I'd better get good with and uh, get good at speaking to people about the significance of the work that I do. And, you know, personally, just as a person who comes from communities where I, who I love, right? I love my folks. I love the people who produce me, I love the communities who produce me. Politically, I'm aligned with Black people um, and um, Black political movements. And if my work draws on the experience of being Black somehow, but does not contribute to the betterment of Black people's lives, um, I'm a colonizer. You know, I'm extracting black lives and turning them into data and I'm giving nothing back. Um, and, you know, so I, I mean, I just feel sort of a moral obligation and it's not like a burden. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to be really clear about that, like speaking to, uh, to different audiences and especially speaking to audiences out of, outside of academia who might be black, um, especially black women, young black people, um, young non-binary people, uh, is that it gives me great joy to do it. Um, my work is better because of it. It really is. My work is more disciplined because I attend to who will this impact? Who will this further? Who will this hurt? Um, how can this be, be misused? You know, to think through those things says I have a responsibility to people. So, uh, you know, I, everybody has a different understanding of public. There's an understanding of public scholarship and public intellectualism that is about branding. And just be very honest, right? This is the, the great idea industrial complex of um, uh, the idea economy, as some people call it. And that's that, that thing where they're jockeying for position as the leading pundit. That is to me, um, that is work that has the veneer of intellectualism without any obligation to a community, right? You can only sell it because you stole it right? You extracted it from people. And that's why you can go out there into the exchange of ideas and sell it, right? Um, I do not do work that is that is disconnected from a community. And so I'm always clear that I don't do that kind of public scholarship. I don't do that kind of public intellectualism. I'm very resistant to being thought of as a pundit. I think that must be a horrible thing to be. Mm -hmm. pundit, like, right, where your whole job is just to always have a comment on something. My God, I don't even want to keep up with stuff enough to have a comment on everything. What a horrible life. But I, I also don't want to be a pundit because I think that is a person who is divorced from a community of people. There's no one to hold them accountable. And that is a really good way to build an individual brand. Um, but here's what history has taught me <laughs> is that when they do come for you, when somebody comes for you eventually, if you didn't have a community that put you there, There'll be no community to defend you once you're there. <laughs> so it's also very self-serving on my part. I don't want to leave everybody behind because I don't want to be out there left on my own. Um, that kind of public scholarship, that is the best of, I think, the work that we can do.
scholarship that's responsible to an audience and to a public. And that's really clear about that and tries to bring them along. Um, at the same time, some of that argument you were talking about has been happening on Twitter. Sometimes my work is used as a cudgel against people who do more complex writing and work. Uh, oh, well, Tressy writes clearly, you know, that means everybody can do it. And so, you know, I, I push back against that too, because often the kind of scholars that they are critiquing are the scholars who are doing the really heavy lifting work of trying to imagine liberation, trying to imagine a post-colonial future, right? That's hard work to do. And it's mostly done by minority scholars who have very little privilege and power in the academy or in the discourse. And so, you know, I, I'm, I don't like, don't hold me up as an avatar for like great writing, uh, uh, clear writing, um, but you can't hold me up as being, you know, you know, I don't mind if they call me par excellence or something, that's great, but not as a cudgel against other people who are doing, I think, really important work. Um, if anything, I think of myself as being the opposite of or the negative image of scholar, uh, people who do intellectual work that doesn't have a community, that's sort of punditry. No, that's great. Thank you for that. And can we just talk about Twitter for a minute? Sure. So one of the things I love to follow you because not only do you talk about your ideas and what's going on with essaying, but also just what it's like being navigating this world in your body mm -hmm. and seeing those interactions and seeing those things, especially as another black woman in an academic space and how you dealt with those. Um, you handle it so well with grace. Well, thank and, your you. shade, and also your shade is very good too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but can you talk about more about how you use Twitter as a public intellectual and leveraged it in a very different way mm -hmm. than we've seen a lot of other academics or so-called public intellectuals use it? Like the way you use it, the way Roxane Gay uses it, it's very, very different than a lot of academics use it. I think that's part of why Roxanne and I became friends, by the way, is that we do have a very uh, similar orientation to some of these things. I mean, so, you know, um, to the extent that I use it differently than some people, I always, I, you know, I, I want to do some feminist praxis work here. I think it's really important for me to um, surface the fact that I do not have children. I'm not raising a family. That changes everything frankly. I don't know if I would be as bossy on Twitter if I had children to feed, right? Um, you know, we can never know the alternative of, of our lives. I like to think I'm still, you know, I'm always authentically me and I take those risks, but I don't, but risk-taking is very different when you're responsible uh, for raising children. And so I always want to surface that. Um, and, the, but my other choices about Twitter uh, have been organic I really never started using the space with a deliberate strategy. And I think that's actually a significant difference between the way I have um, developed on the platform and developed a platform on it, um, is that I did not have a strategy. By the time academics, um, more senior academics certainly, and more, I would say, mainstream academics came to Twitter, um, you know, those of us who had been in the early days there, we'd already figured out a lingo, we had a rules, you know, norms had been set. And some of those norms, the initial early days of Twitter, one of those norms was that you used your real name and but you did not draw on your professional status or reputation it was actually sort of like a badge of honor and participation that in this space i'm just tressy right i'm not tressy the the proto you know prototype or whatever um as the platform matured, as especially as journalists became very uh, significant on the platform, academics uh, tended to follow. And in those early days, I did a lot of those workshops. You know, I was the young scholar who knew how to work Twitter and they'd have me come do a workshop. Uh, I did a couple of those before I decided I'd never do another one again. Um, because what would happen is they dropped me in this room with, you know, very senior people and who really just wanted to know, how do I sell my book? Right. How do I become known as the scholar who coined the term X? Right. Uh, and I was like, you, you don't <laughs> like right. I was just in front of the room going like you can do that, but you're going to subvert the entire value proposition of Twitter, which is organic weak links. Right. Of networks 
that if you came in with such a deliberate marketing branding type strategy, you'd get some traction, but you'd never get the true um, amplification value of Twitter. Um, that was a hard sell to academics, and it actually still is. And that is because our, you know, our profession is structured in such a way that um, only a very elite subset of scholars are allowed the privilege of performing authenticity, right? That's elite white male scholars of a certain pedigree are allowed to be quirky and have a personality. Everybody else is supposed to discipline themselves to the centrism and the conservatism of the field. It's why so many minority scholars find the profession so oppressive feeling, or you have to give up everything about yourself. Um, and I remember a moment when Twitter was professionalizing, academics were entering the space, and there was a push-pull effect on, you know, on me to try to get me to, you know, what side of this am I gonna be on? Or are they gonna take me seriously? And I thought, if you didn't take me seriously before, you're not gonna take me any more seriously if I become less of myself. Uh, I'm just gonna double down on being who I am and that I know this platform better because I've been here longer and I both use it and study it. And it was just a risk. It really was a calculated risk on my part that I, I wasn't gonna do all of the professional branding. Um, I think that has mostly worked out for me, but I say to, to, to other scholars and especially junior scholars coming up, um, behind me, which feels weird to say, because I don't think I'm that old yet, but whatever. That's what they call me when they reach out to me. And, and so they, <laughs> and I say to them, everybody's got to make their own risk assessment about that. I still think that you trying to control the uh, Twitter effects, you will always lose. The platform is designed for you to lose. So you may as well get into the waters and figure out how to build an authentic platform, but I also understand everyone doesn't want to take that same risk. Um, but yeah, it was a, at some point, it started organically, and then at some point, it was just a decision for me to double down on what I thought I knew best. Well, that was, it's great. Um, to kind of lead in, there's um, there's an audience question, but I want to lead into like how you and Roxane Gay became friends and mm -hmm. developed Here to Slay. And then okay. I'll lead into the audience question. Oh, sure. So uh, Here to Slay is a podcast. Um, this started, I, one of those pictures just popped up too, about two weeks ago. It was a, the anniversary of the event that Roxanne and I were attending. And we were in the car on the way back from the event. I think we were in New Mexico. And um, and I was Roxanne's opening act, you know. <laughs> That's what I call it. She gets me, I call it. I was like, I'm I'm the opening act. She's she's oh, because she's so generous. She books it, and when she's gonna bring a person who's her interlocutor, she gets you the same deal she has. I mean, she's one of these. She's the real deal, right? And I in no way should have had such a deal at that time. You know what I mean? Um, but she brought me along. And so I like to give a hard time by telling her I was her opening act, but she was always equitable from the outset. But I did understand my job as I'm here to make Roxanne look good, to be a good questioner and to pay attention and to have the audience see in her what I see in her which was that she is not just this like serious person who writes about trauma but she's funny as hell and silly mm -hmm. and like a good friend and a good person and I wanted the audience to see that so I'm her opening act for the thing and we're in the car on the way back and we're like god we had a lot of fun you know we had just cracked up for two hours I mean we went in with no plan we just really had a good time and the audience was really great and uh, and she said, well, you know, people have been after me to do a podcast. I said, yeah, people have been after me too, but we were talking about two very different levels of people. She had like <laughs> Apple, a bit was after her. I'd had like people from like, you know, the Berkman center ask me to do one. It was very different. And, uh, and she, I was like, but I don't want to carry that kind of thing. I mean, I had, I think thick was out. I think I was still touring. Um, I think I was still pre-tenure, if you want to, I mean, how wild this was. I think maybe my file was out or something. I mean, but, you know, I was a working person. Uh, and I was like, I can't carry a podcast. And she said, me either. You know, she had too many jobs. And we said, well, it'd probably be easier if we did it together. Uh, and that's where the idea started. I think we wrote the tagline for the show in the backseat of that car sent a couple text messages to each other over a few weeks about like, what do we want to do in the discourse? Who do we want to be? Um, and we're like, ah, we'll try it out. 
<laughs> from the, but we always had this idea, our vision, the way we pitched it was this, we wanted this to be a black feminist daily show. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, I also like Trevor very much. Trevor's my, Trevor's my buddy. And we liked, we liked the daily show and thought there are no black women at the time. There were no black women in that space. We now have Amber and of course, and others who are killing it by the way. Um, but we didn't, there was nobody. Uh, and we wanted that model, but in an audio format. And we wanted it to be free willing and honest, much like our, you know, our Twitter authenticity, which was, you know, no, no topics are off the table, that we could be both serious and approachable at the same time. Um, but we knew we were gonna have to like model that in the show. Um, and yeah, we have a really good time doing that together. Yeah, we just get together twice a week and talk to each other. That's great. Amazing. So the first question we have from the audience is about the podcast. It's okay. like when you interview people for the podcast, what is the approach for the first question for the interview? Oh, that's a really good one. Yeah. Do you think it's better open, open-ended or more mm -hmm. icebreaker-esque? Yeah. What is the approach for that first question? Over time, so we've been recording now for, I think, two years. Over time, Roxanne and I have kind of developed like our roles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I tend to double down on being Southern. You know, I'm very gracious. We have manners that we've invited you into our home, right? We're going to take care of you. Um, and Roxanne is just, you know, always pitch perfect prepared. Like she knows every project the person's worked on, you know, and has memory of recall. I have no memory. And so she makes people at, you know, she'll put people at ease by making sure they know that we know their work. Mm -hmm. um, because we have so many women on the show. Our, our default guest, we like to say, is always a Black woman. If a Black woman was busy, then we go to everybody else. <laughs> so, so we're so, that when we do things um, as women, more broadly, we get invited to these kinds of shows or something. Roxanne and I have experienced it. We go into these rooms and people have no idea what we do. They have no idea. We're just there to be the color for the day. You know what I mean? So one of the things we take super seriously is we have a brief about every guest. We treat them seriously and we want them to know we've done that, especially our black women guests. We know your work. We know why you're valuable. Um, and so in those roles, our first questions are usually not even questions. It's a, it's a key key session. It's a, hey, you're home. You're good here. You're safe. We're gonna have a really good time. We always tell them, listen, there are no gotchas here. If you wanna take anything off the record, you just stop us and we do it. Um, so it's table setting. I think of it as putting out the good stuff. You know, we set the table. And then usually the first question is something about like what's going, what matters to you right now? Like what's going on with you? What matters to you? So we try to have a human centric question. Yeah. Um, which we have learned helps us get over everybody's propensity to come in in marketing mode. Mm. You know, I've got a new project and I'm doing blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, we think you can do that anywhere. Um, we would much rather our guests, our, our audience get to hear you be a human being. Um, and I got to tell you, it's not that tough to do, um, especially over time. I think as the guests have, you know, get to know the show, they come in and they know what the show is. And we actually now have problems getting people to stop, like to slow down long enough to get recording. We've learned to start recording the minute we get on because we were losing good stuff. Like people would just come in the studio and start, you know, doing this and we weren't even recording yet. So we've learned to press the button very early in the process. But the first questions I think are always important to, uh, what's important to the sound and the texture of the show is that they be human questions. Mm -hmm. um, that shifts, I think, everybody's orientation to their more expertise-oriented questions. Once you've treated someone like a human being, you get a much sharper response to their work, you know? People, please post your questions. So I want to follow up about the humanity question, mm -hmm. um, especially in thick when you talk about um, Black girlhood interrupted. Mm -hmm. Um, and how even as a Black woman navigating this world, how that still comes up in different ways, shapes, and forms, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do the question or explaining your humanity constantly, mm -hmm. um, what is, especially with everything with BLM and the current trial, what happened with 
45 in the sedition. Um, how, is, how are we going to define humanity in higher ed? What is, mm. what is also the, what does educational gospel also look like that you speak about in lower ed? What does that look like now? Or does yeah. it exist? I mean, unfortunately, it looks very much like it did when I was writing lower ed. I mean, the premise of lower ed, which never really got like mainstream. I mean, it was wonderfully reviewed. So this is not me. Let me knock on wood and superstitious. I'm not tempting fates. It was wonderfully reviewed and received book. Um, but you know, the one thing I wish I could have gotten like every journalist to hit home with was that there was nothing happening in what I defined as lower ed that was not true to a different degree for all of higher education. I was always saying that this subset of for-profit, high cost, low quality, high debt institutions were a concentrated example of the trend lines that were reshaping all of higher ed, that you could not have at the heart of higher education, public higher education anyway, democratized higher education. You could not have at its heart a public goods mission and a consumer model of delivery, that the two could not sustain each other over the long term. That what you had to do to turn a student into a consumer was going to undermine the public goods mission, which in turn was going to undermine student faith and investment. And that once you got trapped in that cycle, you could look ahead and see what had happened to Everest. You could look ahead to see what had happened to ITT and that that was what you were racing against. That was the clock. Right. And the only questions for me that were on the table were what were the mechanisms that would shape the degree of that acuity and how could people intervene? Right. Who was supposed to intervene and how we could intervene? Well, all of that is still true. Mm -hmm. All of that is still true. Um, you know, crisis like uh, COVID, right, um, interjects a new layer, both of possibility and profiteering, right? So the flip side of disaster capitalism, you know, uh, that whole model is that it's also usually a pretty good moment for social movements and social change. Um, and it's too early for me to know which of those COVID will have produced, but the indicators are leaning towards, you know, you know, some institutions have doubled down on the profit modeling, the ed education gospel. And some institutions, I mean, I'll be fair, I'm not the most Pollyanna-ish, but some institutions I think did see themselves right there at the precipice during COVID of what it meant when your students have been trained to think of themselves as customers and their families understood themselves as customers, you no longer had anything. You couldn't go to them and say, listen, for the good of the institution, we gotta close down if we wanna be here in a year. Customers don't care. Customers don't care if the Walmart closes next week because there'll be another Walmart. You see, that's what the consumer model did. And if nothing else, I think crisis brought that home for some institutions. Um, for other institutions, they got a different takeaway message. And this is how we get into the culture wars and cancel culture and all of that nonsense. They're doubling down on a culture war position um, because they can't beat the economics, right? The, the economic model is just not there for them. Um, but at the heart of all of this for me is a question about, are we gonna be a public goods mission? And if we are, then you can't say you serve customers, you serve human beings in a public goods institution, you serve human beings and human beings are complicated and messy and can't be reduced to metrics. Um, and we have to become comfortable again with understanding that. And that's a problem that nobody understands better than black folks and black women, that your institutions are only as, as, uh, as healthy as the humanity of the least vulnerable people in them. If you got poorly paid staffers, you got poorly, even worse paid subcontractors. If you have investments in fossil fuels and other things that are destroying communities and the welfare of the world, if you have a political uh, uh, motivation uh, for how you run the institution, um, those are damaging to the most vulnerable people in your institution and you can only be as healthy as they are. Thank you.
we could go on for the rest of the time for that. So I, do so, I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> the next question we have for the audience is what are your thoughts about faculty and academics adopting identities of oppressed people to legitimize their scholarship oh. in their areas? and also obviously benefit in other ways professionally. Oh, you're gonna get me into all these these women pretending to be Latinas and yeah. uh, black women, right? Mm -hmm. All right, Absolutely. yeah, we gotta, what are we up to now? Truly, I've lost the thread. I don't know how many we're up to now. The uh, And I don't know any of them or their names. I'm so sorry uh, because I'm, I apologize, you know, sorry to this man, but they are interchangeable. <laughs> they are just, they're so similar, I cannot keep track. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So, but yes, there is this like, what a bizarre moment, right? Um, so like, I can get myself in a lot of trouble here. But I, so I'm gonna say a couple of things. Uh, there is the perspective that this is the inevitable ends of attaching value to identities in academic institutions, right? Um, you know, that is the libertarian, um, there's a, there's a weird marriage there of, you know, weird bedfellows between some libertarians, some center left and leftist people who would love to get the identity out of identity politics, you know, who think, well, this is what happens when you, um, voucherize basically minority identities and attached resources. The only problem I have with that argument is that there have never been any real resources attached to minority identities. There have never been any real resources. Right. I can count on one hand, and most of the people in this room who are non-white or minority scholars can too, the number of people at institutions who are people of color who can actually move money. Not the people who can sit on your panel, not the people who are very well-known celebrity professors or Cornell West, uh, Skip Gates, right? And we know the names. Again, there's only as many, right? Mm -hmm. How many of them though can actually move money? How many of them can actually hire? How many of them can hire tenured faculty? Because we all agree that that is where the balance of power lies in the institution. Very, very, very few. So there's not a lot of resources attached to minority identity. There has been some cultural capital, however, attached to being a minority identified person in institutions. But minority people didn't do that. White institutions did that, right? When they gave us identity-based centers and uh, identity-based programming instead of tenure lines, right? They created cultural capital that was tied to minority identities. So I just, I wanna take a chance. That's one of the first times I've had the opportunity to just reject some of that language about how this is the inevitable ends of us having minority-based centers, African-American studies and Hispanic studies, this is what's gonna happen. No, we didn't do that. Right. We were asking for money. You gave us this instead. And this creates these incentives, these perverse incentives. Now, why people do it, I think, is another thing. I don't know. I think that is the realm of probably psychology. Seriously, mm -hmm. there's something psychological happening there. What I am as a soci sociologist, what I'm more interested in is how they got away with it for so long. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's more interesting to me, Nicole, because that question brings up, uh, well, power, frankly. Who has the power to steal someone else's identity and make everybody else agree with them? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It ain't, it's not us. Right. It's not us. And so who, you know, who gives people a pass for pretending to be something they're not? Um, and what does and what does that serve an institution to let people do that? Right. There has to be something. Because um, I refuse to believe that people haven't known about all of these people. And, and in fact, the next thing that always happens after one of the stories, right, is there are people who come out and go, we knew. Mm -hmm. They're just usually minority people who had very little power. But there are people who say, we always questioned it. We always pushed back. But no one would, li like, you know, we couldn't. Well, now that's a different question. Why wasn't there anyone willing to listen to them? Right. Why were they so invested in this performance of a minority that they would overrule the actual lived experience of real minority people? Right. That's uh, that's a more interesting question to me. So let's talk about the, the performance part. Mm -hmm. Is it because no one listened to what was authentic because the performance 
is more comfortable. It's safe and it's it's situated in the stereotype. Is that mm -hmm. the reason why it was so comfortable for? Yeah. You know, a very good friend of mine who I won't name because she may not want me to out her this way. But she and I have talked about this quite a bit. And there is, you know, uh, I borrow it from uh, George Bush, the senior. So forgive me for that, but it was a different time. But, you know, this tyranny of low expectations mm. of the types of the expectation that particularly predominantly white institutions um, have of what a minority scholar looks like, sounds like, and does, right? When that package shows up exactly as you expected it to show up, and who knows better what your expectations are than a person who is one of you, right? So it's no surprise to me that a white woman would know best what performance would satisfy a white audience's desire for a minority scholar. Who would know that better? than they would. Who would know what would fly with white gatekeepers than someone who is from that cultural milieu, yeah? So that part makes sense to me. I do, and I, but I do think, yeah, that there's something to having very low expectations of what minority scholars and scholarship is, that it is rooted, so many of the expectations of what our scholarship will be is rooted in who we are, and our embodiment of something that as long as the body is there, nobody bothers to question or engage with the actual scholarship or work. Um, and so in valuing the performance of minority scholars, I do think you open up an avenue where as long as somebody will perform it, they can get away with it. So we have predominantly white institutions doing that with black and brown faculty, what is that doing to black and brown indigenous students with that mm -hmm. tyranny of low expectation? Yeah, it's a tough uh, road to hoe to be a student. I mean, when you arguably have, you know, undergraduate institutions, I say to people, undergraduate students have some power in, in, in an institution. Graduate students have none which is why really the best way to think of them are as laborers. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that we hide a lot of the unfairness of um, the power relationship with graduate students and institutions by calling them students. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think that it, when you are on that losing end of that power dynamic in a predominantly white institution, and to a certain extent, Minority serving institutions have some of their own power relationships too. They just are different. Um, but in predominantly white institutions, it is, it's actually hard to explain, I think, to white scholars just how this place of that for them is so liberatory. That is so, um, that is really at the heart of the modern idea of American meritocracy and social mobility is for many minority students, a site of stagnation um, and violence and oppression and extraction. And then being extracted from is just a very violent feeling process. That's the violence, I really mean that extraction, right? Um, that those things not only coexist in the same institution, but more importantly, the experience of predominant of white students in a PWI is possible because of the extraction from the non-white students, right? There's not just those things peacefully coexist, but one can exist because the other is there. Um, and then when you add that layer of performative diversity, which is what I think is at the heart of what we're talking about here, these scholars who do this, um, that you take away one of the few avenues that uh, the students have to create a buffering effect mm -hmm. at the institution, uh, because that's what minority scholars so often provide for our non-white students, we're a buffer. We can't always change the institutional climate. Mm -hmm. We can't always move resources around to make it more humane and more you know, practicable for the students. But you know, we know, we know what our office space becomes for them. We know what it means when they come and talk to us. Um, when you turn that, the most intimate of relationships on the campus into one where they run the risk of being fundamentally lied to and tricked by someone who entered into an intimate relationship with them under a false premise. You and I are alike in this, in this vulnerable way. 
I think it's, it's akin to me of like a, of your therapist um, becoming inappropriately familiar with you. It's a violation of a therapist relationship, you know? Um, that's what I think we run the risk of um, when that happens. I have felt so badly for the, so many of the students in one of the, one of the cases, uh, the woman who was performing being a Latina, Afro-Latina, um, had been the faculty advisor of the Afro-Latina graduate students group. And so many of them wrote about just feeling not just lied to, but what they were really talking about was a deep betrayal and a traumatic experience. Um, that's the risk. Um, before I take this next question, I wanted to follow up, especially about the experience of, of graduate students and being employed. I have a dual role. I was a full-time doctoral student. Mm -hmm. I left to go get a job and I'm yeah. still now a doctoral candidate and fighting the, the, the predominantly white institution, mm -hmm. but to the point where I had to email for my work account for them to understand you can't just talk right. to me right. that kind of way. Can you just talk about what happens, especially for Black women doctoral students in mm -hmm. these spaces? Um, I know a couple of folks I know that are finished, they talk about how their health suffered and it took them uh -huh. like a year to two years to even feel like themselves when yeah. they're dealing with the process. Listen, if they got it done in a year or two years, they're doing better than I did, certainly. I don't know what's average, but I know many years ago when I was a graduate student, still myself, I moderated a online journal, um, open access journal, Black feminist journal, whose name escapes me at the moment. But the, 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 the panel session was about Black academic women's health and health experiences and outcomes because we'd had like this and there's, we still really arguably uh, are in the middle of but we'd had like a really uh, prominent rash at the time of black women academics who had died really quite young you know you're talking 47 50 52 right um, and we're like what has happened that you were you have black women who have that much cultural capital that much social capital, maybe not economic capital, but certainly more economic capital than your average African-American um, woman um, finds themselves dying from things that are best understood as like just stress-related traumas. That's what a stroke is. That's what, you know, uh, diabetes is arguably, right? So many things, these are stress uh, responses like how are we going to understand that and that we needed to talk about black women's black academic women's health outcomes um and then i moderate this thing and then you know as is the case with human beings find myself having the exact same issue i mean graduate school was for me a physically draining and traumatic experience um mostly as a consequence of the drain of managing the duality necessary to survive and thrive in graduate school. Um, mastering two different languages, mastering two different discourses, um, trying to master my expertise without sacrificing uh, the communities that I wanted to keep with me. I tell people all the time when we talk about how school can transform a student, we always think of the transformation as being pleasant. Mm -hmm. But transformation can also be quite traumatic. Mm -hmm. uh, upward mobility gives you many positive indicators, um, but across the board can also be a very debilitating experience for people. Even poor white students who move up the income ladder, experience feelings of grief and loss and trauma. I mean, upward mobility might be a, a social good, you know, for a community, but individually it's quite challenging. And graduate school might be the worst of them all because you get the cultural capital and arguably don't get the economic capital that, you, you know, would allow you to get like better health care and, you know, the things that might help. Um, it took several years. I mean, I think I'm still working through the physical trauma of graduate school. It took several years, but at least I'm still alive to work through it. I think about all of the black women we've lost uh, either through disease or illness um, or mental health um, illnesses um, because we don't have a language for the trauma of being successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that word. 
Yeah. Um, the next question we have from the audience is, um, they work in faculty affairs at a predominantly white institution, and they're very disheartened when they review evaluation of candidates of color, that there's so much blatant bias and that it happens all the time. It makes them wonder if they'll ever increase uh, representation in the professoriate because these evaluations are frequently used to justify passing on the candidates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, even as they pointed out, um, it doesn't matter because there's an over-reliance on quantitative data to prove hiring process is objective. Yeah. How do academics from underrepresented backgrounds combat this? I mean, by themselves, you don't. Um, I will say, um, oh, uh, what is her name? Uh, a scholar on Twitter, uh, she's at, uh, I think she's at Berkeley, just said something. She said uh, two days ago that for the first time, for her first time in academia, she had just reviewed a letter of recommendation for an incoming student cohort that had been collaboratively written by the student uh, undergraduate academic community. And she said it wasn't lost on her that that letter was also written by feminist scholars um, of whom many were scholars of color. And she said, what would it mean for us to critique or respond to or push back against the individualism of academic labor mm. um, and academic prestige by moving to this collaborative letter writing model, a collaborative way of doing recommendations. And I thought, I mean, it actually blew my mind. I said to her, wait, we can do that? Because that's brilliant. That not only is that better, a better assessment, mm -hmm. which we do know, by the way, by sociologists of education had on, we know from uh, you know, experimental high schools that have done holistic grading, that don't do a letter grade, instead do narrative grading. We have learned that that is a better assessment tool. It's a less efficient one. Mm -hmm but it is a better one. So the, the race for efficiency is one that doubles down on quantitative measures because it's about routinizing the process. But if your goal is to actually have a better functioning department, um, to make better quality hires, people who will be happy there and therefore will stay, et cetera, that sort of qualitative comprehensive assessment is actually much better. Um, and it also, one of the things, the more we talked about this uh, online, the more we thought about not only does it shift our understanding of academic labor, but it would build in checks on exactly that kind of thing. If you're writing a letter collaboratively, you've got to negotiate assessments like, well, she speaks really well, which is of course racially coded, or uh, you know, she's decided not to have children, something people do still say about female uh, candidates, by the way, you know, referencing her motherhood status or her marital status, um, that an individual letter writer can get away with that. And it can be seen by the reviewer on the other end because of the individualism of the process. But in a collaborative process, you have more checks and balances on precisely that type of, at the very least, people would have to negotiate and defend their language choices, right? It's like a built-in peer review process for the quality of the assessment of a candidate. And I absolutely loved that idea because what we know um, is that left to their own devices, uh, women candidates are more uh, have women candidates get letters that are rife with all kinds of sexism that tends to focus more on their appearance than it does on their, their appearance and their behavior slash attitude than on their scholarship. We love to call women nice. She's so nice. She's so kind. The students love her. She always brings, they comment on the food she brings to department parties, you know, all of that kind of nonsense. Scholars of color get indicators of what kind of value they will bring as a diversity not node instead of a focus on their scholarship. Um, we know that people like to talk about, again, how, how conditioned minority scholars are, whether or not they're a good fit, basically a good fit for white upper class, um, social class expectations, as opposed to, again, their publication record, et cetera. Um, and that that kind of focus on cultural capital uh, privileges white male candidates, right? Um, we know that, but then we haven't built a system that will respond to that. We, we talk about it a little bit in faculty, um, student reviews of faculty, but it's probably just as pernicious at the point of hiring as it is at faculty review. 
Um, and we don't talk about that at all, but I love this idea of how a sort of peer reviewed collaborative recommendation process would be a really great feminist response to that. So I'm gonna kind of combine two of the last questions because mm -hmm. we are quickly running out of time. One is from a black uh, faculty member, a professor um, talking about uh, the experience their, their black students are having um, at their institution and that their authentic self tells them that they should tell them to find an HBCU mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and go. And it's like, am I doing a disservice to the students and what is the authentic line and that they struggle? The other question is from a black student about dealing with professors who are constantly performing as different races than their own. Mm -hmm. How do they really do that? How do they deal with that and address it? Mm -hmm. Well, for the first part, um, I think that as a Black faculty member, one of the best, I mean, as a, you know, as a product of a historically Black college, um, I am very fond, and I always get students, especially, it just happened to me at Emory a lot, but it happened at VCU too, you know, a Black student would find me and they're unhappy, right, at school, and they want to know if everything would have been better or different if they had gone to an HBCU instead, and I tell them, just like everything else in life, it is a trade-off. And then I tell them what I think the trade-off is for, was for me. And I say, this is your probably one of your first opportunities to make a decision for yourself in your life where there are no bad choices, but there also aren't any perfect choices. And that, I tell them, is life. <laughs> where there will not be for you a perfect institution. There will just be one that has less of the things that will make you um, uh, dysfunctional and more of the things that make you feel safe enough to learn. For some of us, it didn't matter where you dropped me, having, I like to say four years, but it took me longer than that, y'all. <laughs> however many years I was, I was in undergrad, that uh, there was a moment there in time, I've talked about this in Thick, and I've written about it in other essays before about having that time out. It was pressing pause on white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Didn't press pause on patriarchy, let's be real. Sorry. Didn't press pause on classism, let's be real. But listen, pressing pause on white supremacy for a few years was just mind expanding for me. It meant though that I didn't have a 24 hour cafeteria, you know, uh, because of historicals, you know, uh, 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 disparities in funding. But for me, what was gonna get me through and I that, I mean, but not all of us are built that way. For some people, I don't need you to press pause on white supremacy for four years. I need this or else I'm not gonna get it done. Um, but I do think like modeling for our students that there is not gonna be a perfect choice. There also isn't gonna be a bad one. Like your life isn't ruined if you go to one or the other. Your life has changed, however, it has changed. Um, and modeling for them how to make those how to reason through those decisions for themselves instead of trying to make it for them was, has always been my model. I'm not gonna tell you where you should go, but if you come and see me, I'm gonna tell you, oh yeah, that, that would have been better at an HBCU. Yeah, are you less likely to have had a racist roommate? Absolutely. <laughs> but I also tell them, you're also gonna have to struggle more to find funding in the summer and it's just gonna look like that. Are you ready to hustle? If you got a little hustle in you, the safety of an HBCU can be amazing, right? And we talk those things through. Um, I've got nothing for the student except say solidarity. I'll tell you, I had to uh, talk about though how you're not safe from that anywhere. I tell the story, I just remembered it recently. Um, undergrad, HBCU, North Carolina Central University, my political science course uh, is taught by a very popular professor um, who wore a dashiki to class almost every day. And we would comment on it. We were like, how many dashikis do you have? Cause he had a fresh one every day. Like he just taking it out of the pack. White as the day he was born, honey. This white man wore a dashiki to class every day. I say that only to say, you will always have some very odd ducks no matter where you attend school. And it's almost never your responsibility to make them less odd. Not your job. It is your other professor's job. That's what we're paid to do. If it is making you uncomfortable, you're, you have the responsibility and the privilege of going to the other people in the department to try to make that right. Um, but as a student, there's not much you can do except to file it away and make it a really good story in your memoir one day, like I intend to do.
Wow. Um, you guys, this has been such a treat. What a just bounty of food for thought. And uh, it's just been, I'm thinking about all these uh, ideas of, of your inspirations about bringing your authentic self to, to everything and, and what a really human centered education mm. looks like. And um, certainly the, you know, <laughs> so many important thoughts about moving away from the consumer model of education mm -hmm. and, and really reinvesting in the public good um i'm going to be i'm going to be processing for a, a long time all of these um really um just the great conversation i'm i'm so grateful to um both of you um uh nicole amazing questions and, and uh thank you nicole yeah just just a treat to um to ponder to wonder i feel like i've had this sort of yeah great meal of food for thought and and uh real inspiration to to, to keep on um to keep on working at these things and 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 being you know well i can't i can't say even any of it as well as either of you have uh but i i want to thank you again uh for, for joining us as as nicole said i feel like this could have gone on uh, a lot longer on any number Indeed. of topics, you know. <laughs> I have to do it again, Nicole. Thank you for the really thoughtful and broad and informed questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Maybe we'll sort of get to he get to hear and and um, see part part two or part three on your on your Substack on your uh, in your podcast as as you you know your your thinking continues to evolve on these incredibly um, important contemporary issues. So um, I'm sure like, yeah, to be continued in all of our, in all of our processing, uh, but, but for, the, for tonight, um, um, thank you. And thank you to uh, the participants who came and engaged. And we look forward to seeing you at um, the next events in, in this uh, speaker series, uh, the Meyerhoff speaker series. Um, David Blight uh, is here on uh, April 14th next week. And then Tanahisi Coates and Tiffany Florville on April 22 and May 3. So we welcome you um, back to, to join us at those. And, and again, um, final thanks to uh, Tressie McMillan Cotton. Just a, a real a real pleasure to have you with us virtually here at Goucher. Good night, everyone.